This is Roll Call for this edition of African Drums. Good night and welcome to this edition of African Drums. Welcome and to this edition of African Drums. Today we are looking at women in the Guyanese society. Yesterday the world celebrated International Women's Day and today we are joined by three extraordinary women from the Guyanese society as we discuss women in the Guyanese society, the historical view, and also women in today's contemporary society, both as agents of change, but also as a group that is affected by some of the issues in our society. I want to take the opportunity to extend today as well um, regards and wishes to the women of Guyana who celebrated International Women's Day as they reflected upon their achievement. And really, the achievement of women has been an achievement of all people and an achievement of the Guyanese society itself. When women progress, men progress, and the society progresses. I want to thank our women for coming on today. Today I'm joined by uh, Miss Cecilia McAlmond, lecturer or former lecturer for the University of Guyana, uh, historian. Um, Mrs. Maxine paris Aaron. Mrs. Maxine paris Aaron is the agricultural specialist at the Inter-American Cooperation for Agriculture, and Ms. Winters White, an activist who I've had the pleasure of working with in the Colvin Harding Support Group, and uh, she is a member of the Red Thread um, organization. Thank you, women, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope you celebrated International Women's Day by doing something excellent yesterday. <laughs> I sure did. What did you do just as a, just as a curiosity? Oh, actually, yesterday I went to go to Burmese to do some matters to do with the Horticultural Society. We have a show coming up. Uh, and I, for the first time for the year, I bought all the four daily newspapers to mm -hmm. see what they had to say on International Women's Day. Okay. What about and you, I Mrs. Aaron? I participated in a march with Citizens Against Rape. Okay. CAR, a newly formed organization, um, they, there was a, a silent march um, around the cities of Georgetown to, to launch a soft launch on the organization and also to bring attention to the atrocities as it relates to women and rape. Okay, and I see you wearing purple and white. Yes. <laughs> as an observant scholar. Yes, yes I see you your purple and white. Okay. And what about you, Miss White? What did you do? Oh, actually, I was supposed to be on that same march that Maxine, I think it is, mm -hmm. spoke about, but I was not feeling well. So uh, I stayed at home and I did a little rebellion. I have to say, I did nothing because <laughs> it was my day. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. And every day really should be Women's Day. Uh, every day should be Women's Day. Um, so, looking at women in the Guyanese society, historically, how have women been viewed in the Guyanese society? Ms. McAlvin, let's start with you. Well, I, I don't think women in the Guyanese society have been viewed any differently from women worldwide because there is always the, the ideas of what women's place in the society should be. Um, they should be seen and not heard. They should be there for the men because politics and public life was dirty and they should be in the home dealing with matters to do with the home and it's all the, the, the patriarchy in our society sadly it still lingers and because of that it has impacted on what women have done because and, and I must butt in here to say that I was very impressed with the media, especially with the Guyana Times and what they did in terms of talking historical, what has happened, what women have achieved. And I would strongly recommend that if you haven't 
how that you could take a look at that because it tells you, it brings you up to date with what is happening and they had an excellent editorial on gender equality. Um, and so uh, historical, because of that perception of what the, the role of women should be in the society, um, women, in a sense, they were called the second sex. Uh, over the years, of course, without going all the details, we know of how hard women fought in starting from 1946 to get the, the vote. In the 19th century, generally expatriate white women, they voted, but that was lost. But after universal adult suffrage, for which women like Janet Jig and others fought, and then little by little, women went into parliament and the executive council, etc. And by the 1980s, of course, the Guyana had one of the largest components of women in parliament. Um, I have written extensively of women in parliament and politics, and one of the, the things I have to say here is that we still have some way to go because despite um, one of the, the WPAs, when they talked about women, that we have achieved 30% women on the list, but that they, when they had the, the constitution reform, the idea was to have one third women, not, not as parliamentarians, and, but that has not been achieved. And um, I'd like to read some, there's a report put out by the, the JED uh, committee where they lo they're looking at a re report card on women for 2014 and there are some statistics. There are 50% women in our population, 61% of them are employed. In the public service, there's 58% in administration, 53% in senior technical positions. In the public service, 66%. For example, in the non-traditional area of dredge owners, we have about 261 women, registered self-employed women, 31%. Women in parliament, parliamentarians, 32%. We still are below the 33%, which was mandated. 30% of the ministers of government are women, 20.2%. We have a deputy mayor who is a woman. 20% of the regional executive officers are women. In the different regions, we have 10, 12, 5% of Women are the, the toshus in the in the Amerindian among Amerindian women. Women in decision making position, judge, the co judge, the solicitor general one, twenty nine percent of the judges, fifty nine percent of magistrate, prominent secretaries, twenty four percent. Um women one of the things we in the in, in the recent past is that women are outperforming men. Or the young girls and, and boys <laughs> in school. And, in school, even as yeah, graduates, mm. but the, the the point is being said, and maybe the other will talk about it, is that is not reflected in decision making positions because there are ways in which structural, you can say, impairments in our society, which keeps the glass ceiling, as they call it, in place. And so despite their achievement in education, women still have not been able to crack that ceiling. Again, I would refer people to that pullout. We can talk for an hour on this, and you can read what women have achieved in banking. And here I must say congratulations to the Ministry of Education. If you go along um, Brickdam, they have a series of printouts of women who are currently in decision-making positions in the Ministry of Education. And I think that, that that was quite good last year. They had a similar thing in, in Parliament. Okay. And so in the, the non-traditional areas, women have come a long way, but there's a long, long way to go. I believe one of the quotes is Anne Green saying that as long as things like violence against women remain an important issue. 
gen empowerment of women, um, domestic violence, no matter what other areas of achievement there has been, we still have a lot to do. Okay. And I, I just this in her presentation, Wilshire, okay. she was talking about some of the problems women face um, in terms of getting justice and how important this is. Um, the Ghana Human Rights Association, they talked about the important role women can play if they participate in the local government elections. And so they're on this new year for looking at gender equality, empowerment are very important issues Jeez. which yeah. must be Address. faced. Which right. must be addressed. So, um, I mean, we, we, we look at women from that historical, that broad historical perspective. And considering that historical perspective, Ms. Iran, uh, I'll direct the question to you. Um, how has the role of women changed over time? Okay. Um, I think in, in the past, the focus for women was on being the nurturer at home. Um, providing care at home and I think because of the way we were socialized we saw that as our role and we stuck with it but I think over time because of the fact that there were pressures even at home to generate income etc women had to go out to work and they went out to work and have asserted themselves in a number of ways to become um, chiefs, uh, CEOs, executive officers, etc. But there is still that role for us at home, starting at home. As the nurturers, we are there, we are the first, as, as it's always said, the parents are the first teachers. And in the home, we are there to start to teach the children. And we are teachers. Um, outside of the home, some of us are teachers, and so we can provide guidance there. As uh, a chief executive officers, we also provide leadership, mentorship, etc. So I think over time, it's probably good that we had to leave home because some of us will probably still be stuck there breastfeeding, etc. So it's good that the pressures of society, industrialization, etc. forced us out of the homes. But I think it's incumbent now on us to see ourselves really seriously in those roles and, and step up a little higher. Because I think that sometimes we are our own worst enemies in that we, we see ourselves we, in this little cocoon. And in, in us, there there's a lot more. So more chief executive officers, more parliamentarians, more people. Uh, the, the mayorship is coming up soon, and I'm hoping that it's a female. I'm really hoping there's a female. <laughs> I, would, I would definitely <laughs> support that. You know, um, women, um, I remember reading years ago, and, and in work that I did, with community organizations as well uh, in the past. And when we always talk about women and women's role and so on, and they say, you know something, you want to get the thing done right and managed properly, you Definitely. have to have women involved. Exactly. You just have to have women involved. Um, in our contemporary society, there are a lot of, you know, there, there, there are issues. There are, some have described the society as a society in crisis. Um, they point to issues of, of domestic abuse in the home, they talk about children's rights, children's abuse. They talk about police brutality. They talk about um, the, the social services, and in some cases, need for social services. They talk about reproductive health and rights. Um, considering this society then, how, has, how have women been affected as a group? And Winters, I wanted to start with you and particularly from your experience at Red Thread. All right. Um, I would like to start with the Colvin Harding story. Mm -hmm. um, it took a woman to make her child, mm -hmm. breastfeed her child, nurture that child, till that child reached a certain age. Then, lo and behold, that child was being abused by the arm of the state, or by the police, and without Without nobody, or without, um, without any concern as this is a woman's child, and this woman feel pain for that child. So 
I want to talk about the organizing work that Red Thread did, Red Thread and Colvin Ireland Support Group did in bringing, in highlighting that issue mm -hmm. and the pain. We as women feel that pain because we are mothers also and we know what it is to make a child, to sit with that child, to care for that child, to rock that child when that child is sick. We know we have to do our house work with that child in our hands because many of us cannot afford to take the child to a babysitter or to a play school. Um, I heard um, Ms. McCallman, I, Ms. McCallman yeah. made reference to some women that the Ministry of Education highlighted as special women. Oftentimes, um, and I want to make reference, and not because I'm a retrain, but I would certainly like to make reference to two great women, and that is Andai and Karen Souza, who I have known for quite a long time, and who have fought for grassroots women and against domestic violence for the entire life. And one would have thought that Andai, she is a senior, was a head teacher, and she's well educated, one would have thought that she would have opted to get a, a big government job or to be an ambassador or something, but she didn't do that. She, she shared her knowledge with grassroots women and fight for grassroots women every day of her life. And that is not making her rich, that is making her poor. <laughs> and um, recently, Karen have won an, um, an yes. award from Anson McCall. And I think she deserve it because Karen oftentimes gave for her, her pocket selflessly to people who came in, women who came in affected by domestic violence. So when we want to look at women in society, certainly we have women in po um, parliament and they have all kinds of issues affecting grassroots women. I have never heard one of them raise their voice on that issue that boring issue, and that's the issue of um, how women could make out with a new government wage of $25,000. How women sleep at night, how women cope, it's not easy. So in my mind that when women in, um, in certain position, like in parliament or place in certain things, that they should champion the cause of women because they are women and they know women have real, real issues. For instance, Norwell, you might be, um, you're a provider, you bring in your money, but it's high up to spend that money, and I have to stretch that money like elastic. <laughs> I have the worrying walk of yeah. staying home and jotting out and cutting off and crossing off. Often time you fall, just if you wake up, you gotta do the same thing. Yeah. And um, as we were saying, and I'm going straight here into the, um, economic we're saying that if they want if they want um like when the government preparing budgets then they should ask grassroots women we are the best economists <laughs> we the are best. the best economists so I, I, I agree with that so let's yeah, talk then about women in the economy you use miss paris here you know, to before we go to oh, that go i would like to um make some comments first again congratulations to karen i know both of those women and i have i've interviewed them and um, I think the issues you talk about, I think Justice Wilshire, she, she talked about the, the need for changes in, in the justice system. And one of the things she highlighted was the need for training of the law enforcement officers. She mentioned women, but one of the, the problems I have there is that in many of our police stations, even where they call in Harding, Sometimes you have no women. And I think that it's not only women who should be trained, women enforcement. It should be all of the, the enforcement people, including the men needed more than the women, because sometimes even if there is a female police officer there, the officer in charge is a man. Mm -hmm. And so they need, all of law enforcement officers need training, including men. And because, let's face it, they're still the decision makers and there, are so, there must be many um, police stations throughout the Australian interior regions where they are men. Talk, talk about the whole issue of trafficking in persons. When you read the newspapers, 
quite often the officers, the men, and, and, and they don't take too much attention to what is being said. And I hear congratulate the my nurse association, and the, uh, the risk which Ms. Brooms has been putting herself to do something for women. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that, it's, it's, it's a very, very important issue. And I agree that women are the, the best, the best the economists, best economists <laughs> in yeah. terms of learning to cut and contrast. Yeah. Yeah. To, 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 to and I think it's speak. important too that we, that we, we bring that, that to decision making. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I am a proponent of a bottom-up type of development, mm -hmm. which sees that the real expertise comes from people who are most affected you know, and those are usually the people who are closest to the issues mm -hmm. in the communities. So definitely, I think I, I for one, would support the proposal, <laughs> um, you know, to see. But, but let's talk a little bit then about women in the economy. And I want to, for this part of the conversation, um, discuss women in the economy from two perspectives. Um, there is women in the, the, the formal economy, women as entrepreneurs, women in, in, in social entrepreneurship and so on. But I want to focus too on the African villages as an economy and how women traditionally have been involved in the village and the village movement and how you see their role in the village. Okay, I, I work with um, indigenous women and um, for the most part, because that is where, um, that's some of where our funding and stuff is aimed. And uh, what I've noticed is that the women in the villages have always had a heart for entrepreneurship. It's, it wasn't always a formalized arrangement in the sense that they made stuff out of need. They would produce enough out of need and sell to the villages, you know, to their neighbors, etc., etc. It is now becoming in the last 20 years or so a more formalized entrepreneurship program. And so there is a place for that in that um, there's a lot of talent in these villages that need to be brought to the fore, need to be organized in such a way that we have more commercialization of, of their skills, etc., and the products. Um, and they're an in important part of, of our economy from the standpoint that they produce things that are affordable, villi their villagers, can, their peers can af um, afford to, to utilize for their families. And then if we organize that, it then becomes trade in itself. Um, and that as far as, as the villages are concerned. Um, women are also in the formal um, commercialization. Um, we have women who own a lot of big industries in Guyana. And they too have become leaders in that they have become the example by which the villagers are now working towards getting there. So I think um, we have something that is worth follow um, developing in terms of village economy. We have um, skills, we have bright minds, and I think that we need to support them. And NGOs are making, uh, international organizations are making an input. The government is also make, putting their input, but, and I think there is a lot of hope and a lot of scope there for village economy. Yeah, um I am the, the village economy, and the, the only tonight was reading about the indigenous women, the one who were involved in the peanut butter, and, butter. and, and that is the Araniputa, mm -hmm. and the, the sword which they've gotten. And in the, the villages, of course, for example, when I go, I do my shopping Saturday mornings at Border Market, and there are a few women by the, the fire station, Afro Guyanese women, and this everything they have at that stand. It's things they produce themselves, mm -hmm. everything. And they, they, some of it is land they inherited from their, their grandparents. And you go there and, and believe it or not, you don't, they sell things cheaper because it's yeah, coming from it. them. Yeah. One of the, I'm, I'm not, one of the things I've been reading about and which I was, um, I was interested in, I, I tried to get some work in, was the WOW initiative, the Women of Work. Yeah. Um, where grassroots, it, it's a collateralist load scheme where women were given loans of 100, once they were earning below $40,000, they were given monies to 
get into some kind of entrepreneurial activities. And um, they said since the, the, the scheme started in 2011, 2012, about 900 women have benefited. And they talk about their like some women who have gotten second and third tranches. Um, I don't know, it, it, it's a GBTI human services scheme. I don't know if this men from the countryside in the villages have benefited or if it's if it's an urban an urban only kind of initiative those kinds of initiatives are important for women in the, the area because you know they don't have collateral one of the things i would like to see in that and other economic initiatives is i've i've heard that some of the many of the women have repaid but some of them have not been able to repeat. And they, they were involved with traditional things like um, hairdressing, baking, floor, um, floral arrangement, cosmetology. And as someone who's worked with NGOs, for example, I was very involved in the Futures Fund and all those NGOs. I've always had a problem with monies being spent for these traditional, because take for example why. If we are trying to empower women economically, how many Guyanese women can really do something in terms of economic empowerment if they go into clothing? They can't compete with those Chinese stores. They, we need to come into non-traditional areas. How many people could, would buy cakes? How many people? So we need to think outside of the box. Um, then, continuing to go, if we really want to empower our women, even in the villages, how many people in the villages will, if you graduate in bread making, that kind of thing, we need to think outside of the box and get women involved in probably other non-traditional areas, mm -hmm. which would really empower them economically. Oh yes, oh yeah. definitely, and I think that, um, uh, without doubt, there has been some, some, some focus on that. I think about the conversation today is about value chain and value added yes, products. Yes, mm -hmm. That how exactly. do we move from the primary products mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. other types products. of products. And you know, in the case of the villages, and particularly you mentioned Ar Aranaputa, mm -hmm. there is a cycle there that mm -hmm. the women get from the farmers in the community and the farmers mm -hmm. are men and women. Mm -hmm. The men sow, the women reap, mm -hmm. and then they take the produce, the peanuts in this case, from them, and they in turn make products to sell to, to, the, sell schools. to the schools mm -hmm. where yes. the children go to. So, you know, it, it is important to view women as part of that cycle, that economic cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, we're approaching time, in fact, we are mm -hmm. at time. So in yes. closing, how do you see, and I'll start with your interest, how do you see women in the future, and particularly from your point of view uh, as a member of Red Thread? All right. Um, uh, I must say that we miss an important part before I answer your question, mm -hmm. that women produce all the time for the economy. And that is, we produce children. And our children produce children, so we produce the labor force for the economy. Mm -hmm. Without that, we can't have an economy. So I w want to say that before. Um, yes. um, I quite agree. It's so much thing, Maria. So I can start where I'm comfortable with. Yes. I quite agree with her. We had this training program, SAP Bun Georgia and all over, and we were telling women that not every day somebody can want a cake bake or anything. Mm -hmm. So we were um, along, um, we were training them to do non-traditional things like electrician, masons, yes. carpentry, so that they could compete in the blue collar jobs, as we like to call it, the men jobs, because the men think that they control that jobs. And women ain't supposed to be a carpenter, and they're not supposed to be a plumber, and they're not supposed to be that. So we were making them marketable, so that they should have a skill that people use, want every day. For instance, you're going to want a plumber every day. So people might want to need a need plumber every day. And when we did that, the men became jealous and said we were empowering the women, and we were not empowering the men. I know you're watching a time now, right? Yes. So I would just... <laughs> Um, yeah. there. No, but but well, it's important because what you're highlighting yes. there is this idea of gender justice, which I know is uh, it's it's more it's more than gender equality. Yep. It's gender justice. Mm -hmm. It's ensuring that there is an equitable society that allows people, regardless of their okay. gender, to, to exist and to function. 
um, in the most productive and efficient way. So in closing, yes. how do you see the future for women, Ms. Paris Aaron? Um, I think the future for women is bright. And I, I think that all we need to do is to step up to the plate. We, there, uh, among us, there's lots of talent. There, there's not a, a firm support network yet. So I am trusting that with all the players involved, the churches, um, secular society, government, that we will make the environment enabling for women. But I think that we have a role in ensuring that that environment is enabling and we can step out there and make it happen. Um, we have the opportunity to come together and I think a lot more women need to come together. We have professional women who are very good at their job but they need to lend a hand. We have young women who need for them to stretch out that hand and pull them along and let them find, uh, find their way, find a road for themselves. So I, I think their future for women is bright, but we need to step up to the plate. Ms. McAlmont. Well, while I endorsed um, what the women have said, I would like to put something as a historian. For all of this to be achieved within entrepreneurship, we need statistics. And one of the things I'm really sad about is that even in 21st century, we're not doing gender disaggregate gender disaggregated data. Mm -hmm. You still, for example, was talking to Mrs. Stevens, not the gender, the, the center, and I was saying I would like to know about women in business. She said, you know that we have hundreds and hundreds of pages from the deeds registry, but it's all mixed up. I did, I've done a lot of work on parliament and parliamentarians, and you still, if you look at it, you don't know who are the men and who are the women. Mm -hmm. There was this period when it was comrade, but now, <laughs> if you just put J. Jones, it could be John, it could be Jean. Mm. And 20, 25 years from now, and even now, when I try to do some work, you still, and I think that is extremely important to support some of these initiatives. And I hope at some point in time, some donor agencies would get some funding to go far back, and, and from now on, we should continue to do this kind of statistics so we can support some of the initiatives which would come on the table and it would, would help to change. Thank you very much, women. And, and you said, you kept saying we, and I want to say it, when you said we, you also meant we, men. Of course. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I think that, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, because certainly yes. uh, it's, yes. it's, it's a responsibility of men and women. Yes. Yes. Uh, and gender justice is, I think, our main goal. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for listening. This has been African Drums, a presentation of the Coffee to Fifty Committee. Today we were talking with some tremendous women as we observe International Women's Day and we looked at women in the Guyanese society. Please continue to join us again next Sunday, same time, 8 o'clock, on this channel, Channel 9. You can also check us out on Facebook at uh, the name Coffee 250 or check us at YouTube on the YouTube channel um, with the same name Coffee 250 where you can find this broadcast and videos of other um, uh, shows and other activities of the Coffee to 50 Committee. We want to thank you, and this has been African Drums. Please join us again next week.
keep growing with iPad. You know, it's indeed a pleasure to be back with you on a program of Grow with iPad. And you know, as always, we have very interesting information to share with you, our micro, small, and medium-sized entrepreneurs. And those of you who would have looked at our program last week, you would remember that we had a very, very fruitful discussion on the Credit Info Guyana. And this week, I'll be having a discussion on a very topical issue, something that is very important and something that affects all of our lives. So it's on that note, I want to invite you to grow with iPad and stay tuned. I'll be right back and we'll have that discussion with a gentleman from the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security. Stay tuned. Pursue a career in business and management or build your human resource capacity with diplomas and advanced diplomas from the Institute of Commercial Management based in the UK. Contact IPED's Entrepreneurial Development Centre. Our diploma and advanced diploma courses include business studies, project management, marketing, office management, human resource development and international trade. Affordable evening classes, qualified tutors, a comfortable environment with free learning materials and study facilities. Choose IPED and ICM. Welcome back and I want to thank you for tuning into iPads this week and as I said in my opening remarks, we have a very fruitful and very interesting discussion on our program this week and I have with me in the studio Mr. Patrick Finlay and he is the Deputy Prominent Secretary, Ministry of Human Resources, Human Services and Social Security and we'll be talking about this very topical issue. It's an issue that affects all of us out there and that is on domestic violence. You know why at IPED we want to sensitize people and we want to ensure that people out there are very active and sensitive in what they do and that is why at IPED we want to bring to you information that will help you as entrepreneurs to better able to manage and survive in your own businesses. 